DJ Rock is here. It is time for the great one to do another reaction. We about to check out Jeffrey Dahmer's last interview. Hi, J Rock. Hands come back to you too. What is happening in 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 with the millions? And millions of J-Rock's fans from all over the world. J-Rock is here. And um, as you all know, Netflix just released their own series of Jeffrey Dahmer. All right? Those of you who don't know who Jeffrey Dahmer is, Je Jeffrey Dahmer is notorious for the guy who killed and ate him. Yeah, that, that was his forte, all right? Uh, there's been a lot of reenactments, movies, and different type of shows put together to all, you know, talk about Jeffrey Dahmer and what he did, all right? Netflix, I saw it, I, I watched it from start to fit. Thought they did um, a good job as they always did. Really, the guy that played Jeffrey Dahmer really made you believe that something was terribly wrong with Jeffrey Dahmer. He is by far one of the biggest pieces of trailer park trash to ever walk God's green earth. Bruh man had a broken home. Now I'm not excusing his actions. There, a lot of people come from broken homes. You ain't eating for them, right? A lot of parents go, a lot of kids have parents who go through divorce. A lot of kids have parents who fight. And you can understand some dysfunction to an extent but when you start killing people and dissecting people and eating people, like, like, no, bro, there's, there's no excuse for that. That is evil uh, to the umph degree, all right? But apparently, before Jeffrey Dahmer was killed in prison, all right, uh, he had a last interview. So we're going to check this thing out, all right? But I do recommend, you want to know more about who Jeffrey Dahmer is if you don't know him, the Netflix series, highly recommended by the great one. It was damn good. 10 episodes long, all about 45-ish minutes each. Good one. Might check it out again, I don't know. But it's showtime. On the night of July 22nd, 1991, Milwaukee police find maximum volume that Jeffrey Dahmer had been desperately hiding for many years. Acting on a tip from a young gay man who escaped from Dahmer's apartment, yeah. police searched number 213 and found a chamber of unimaginable horrors. Human heads and a heart wrapped and bagged in the freezer. Hands and feet at the bottom of his soup kettle. Skulls tucked away in a file cabinet. And this blue barrel stuffed with dismembered torsos soaking in acid. Dahmer would spend the next 24 hours confessing, telling in vivid detail of a murder spree that began in 1978 when he was 18 and ended with 17 young men dead. I had this reoccurring fantasy of, uh, of uh, meeting a hitchhiker on the road and uh, of taking him hostage and, and doing what I wanted. And uh, Sick. I never in my Twisted. wildest nightmares thought that uh, it would become a reality. Why would Dahmer have, as he put it, created his own holocaust? How did he become so filled with evil? It would be comforting to point to an abusive childhood, an early life filled mm -hmm. with hatred or horror, but his was filled with love. Jeff was the most beautiful, darling, sweetest baby, the nicest young boy there just were no real signs uh, when he was growing up imagine your child grows up to be a murderer would you still love him would the guilt and sense of responsibility be overwhelming yeah you still Jeffrey love him but like bro i can't ride with you on this stuff to understand what might have gone you gotta face the consequences on this one. his father's search for an explanation led him to look inward even to write a book simply titled a father's story yeah. But his search may be in vain, because even the experts and profilers who've studied serial killers are baffled by why they do it. There doesn't seem to be any indication in any of the serial murderers that something external makes them want to kill. It's as if something is thrown, a switch is thrown, 
and they begin on the pattern of what their pattern will be. Maybe all we can do is what Lionel Dahmer did, look back and try to see what went wrong. As a young child at the beach with his parents, Jeffrey Dahmer discovered a dead crab. He examined it with a child's curiosity, but later the curiosity grew into something unthinkable. All I know is that uh, I wanted to, to see what the insides of these animals looked like. I, I, um, there may have been some violence involved, some underlying subconscious feelings of violence. Uh, I just, it was, a, it was a compulsion, it became a compulsion. Jeffrey Dahmer got bigger and so did his compulsion to look at the insides of living things. He began to kill them, satisfying powerful urges that he didn't understand. In ninth grade, uh, in biology class, we had uh, the usual dissection of uh, fetal pigs. Yeah, I saw that. And uh, I, took, I took the remains of that home and, and kept uh, the skeleton of it. And I just started branching out uh, dogs, cats, I suppose it could have turned into a, a, a normal hobby like taxidermy, but it, it didn't, it veered off into, into this. More and more, Dahmer killed animals in the woods behind his house. He knew it was wrong, but he couldn't stop. Then, at 14 or 15, it got worse. I don't know, that's, it that's... became a compulsion, and it switched from animals to humans. I, I, I still don't understand it. I don't know why. If your fantasy life as a teenager includes You're killing, sick. That's what who it is. do you tell? From uh, about 15 years on up, uh, a great deal of my thoughts were uh, basically unshareable with anyone. So I just uh, closed myself off and uh, just put on uh, a mask of normalcy. As Jeffrey Dahmer entered adolescence, his secrets multiplied. He began to feel attracted to other young men. It was not an issue he could talk to his father about, but Jeffrey knew he was gay. Started have, having obsessive uh, thoughts of, of uh, violence uh, intermingled with sex. And it just got worse and worse. Uh, I didn't know how to tell anyone about it, so I didn't. And just as Jeffrey was becoming aware of his internal violent sexual urges, his external life began to unravel. His parents' marriage, which had been rocky throughout his childhood, finally ended. He found himself alone more and more. And then one night, while his mother was away on a trip and his father newly moved into a motel down the street, a fantasy Jeffrey had been having for years came true and the killing began. I, I, I found out that they showed this in the Netflix series where his mom moved, took his younger brother with her. Dad, I don't know if, where he was, but they left him alone by himself in the house for like three months. By himself. No food, no nothing by himself now i don't know whether they have child protect service well he was an adult i think he was 17 or 18 by that point but still like you don't you don't do that that's just no you can't go you don't you don't check on your child for three months 18 years old driving home uh, i saw this hitchhiker about a mile from my house yeah and he caught my eye. I drove past him, thought to myself, should I stop and pick him up or should I just keep on going? Uh, I wish I just keep on, kept on going, but I didn't. Turned around, picked him up, and uh, that's when, that's when it, the nightmare became a reality. It just, uh, it, it just seemed so bizarre to me that this obsession that I had been thinking about and wanting, just uh, all the all the parts are there, and they, they make it possible to make it happen, just at the just at the time 
when it could happen, when there's nobody at the house for two weeks. After the first time he murdered, Dahmer says that he tried to get control of himself, and for six years he did not kill again. In 1984, he found himself living in Milwaukee, frequenting gay bars, when the violent sexual urges overcame him again. Mm -hmm. I met this guy at one of the uh, bars, downtown Milwaukee bars. We went back to the hotel. Just planning on uh, getting drunk, I had put some sleeping pills in his drink to render him unconscious. And I uh, was just going to spend the night with him. When I woke up in the morning, uh, my forearms were bruised, and his chest was, was bruised, and blood was coming out of his mouth. He was hanging over the side of the bed. This type of behavior and the urge that develops, it's triggered. It doesn't go in cycles. It may be a place that he's in that reminds him of something. It may be something that he hears. It may be a certain season. Uh, it may just be a color. It's intimately connected with memory and previous experiences and something that goes on at an unconscious level. Whatever it was, it came over Dahmer almost like a dream. I have no memory of beating him to death, but I must have. Yeah, I saw that. And that's but, when, it, but when he, it all started again. He was uh, drugged, too. I had no intention of, of hurting him at all. How could Dahmer not remember? It's hard for a normal person to imagine, but Dr. Helen Morrison believes that the brain functioning of serial murderers is unique. Part of his mind is split off. Again, we have this piece of this puzzle that's somewhere that doesn't connect with the thinking part or the logical part. It's not far removed from those of us who drive every day and we drive the same route and we don't know how we got from point A to point B. We know we did it but it doesn't enter our consciousness. Unlike other serial killers who seem to actually derive satisfaction from the killing, Jeffrey Dahmer says he did not. His motivation, his objective was sexual. He wanted to create a sexual slave that he could totally control. And to that end, he performed the most horrific of experiments on his victims, literally drilling holes in their head. I tried to uh create uh, living zombies with uh, muriatic acid in the, in the drill uh, but it, it never worked no the killing wasn't wasn't the objective i just wanted to have the person under my complete control uh, to do with as i wanted dr helen morrison who profiles these men says part of the reason is because serial killers like dahmer literally feel things differently than a normal person to the serial murderer, it's very similar to the young child who may pull the legs off of a daddy long legs or a fly. See what happens. There is no humanity there. It's just, oh, this is a very interesting thing. They do things to individuals that they've never experienced themselves. They want to see pain, or they want to see fear, or they want to see agony. And with Dahmer, that experimenting included what had to be the most shocking part of this case. He sometimes ate his victims. An idea abhorrent to anyone with even vaguely human sensibilities. Oh. And yet here again, Dr. Morrison says that in fact, Dahmer's behavior makes a peculiar kind of psychological sense. Jeffrey Dahmer was not the only individual who was a cannibal or bit his victims or used teeth as a weapon. If you remember about infancy, if we go purely psychologically, the only way an infant interacts with his world around him is through touch, feel, and teeth. And this is a way you know, if it eat nobody their world with their mouths. That's what they use. That's how they relate to the world. And what is eat. evident in Express all milk. Of the serial murderers is this trait of very oral or mouthing or biting or eating, ingesting which is highly infantile but it seems to be a way in which they can be with their victim it, it made me feel like they were uh, a permanent part of me besides besides the you didn't get diarrhea from that bro of what it would be like it made them feel that what kind of diseases of they had did you catch sexual uh, uh, satisfaction to do that
By the late 80s, Dahmer had spiraled completely into a free fall of killing. A serial killer was on the loose in Milwaukee, but why wasn't anyone noticing? Because he was so low key. Serial killer profiler Robert Ressler he was so says low key. It was easy for Dahmer to hide. He was fairly good looking and uh, uh, very shy. And I think uh, I've often said that in, in any Always uh, a quiet group, ones. Uh, you could put him right in the middle of uh, a college group and, and uh, probably you would look at him as a, as a decent young man. And that was Dahmer's Always most powerful weapon in luring his victims into his world. Seventeen in total. They had several traits in common. They were all men, all young, mostly minorities, and almost all were gay. Starting in 1984, one by one, these men disappeared. But nobody in Milwaukee had any idea that a serial killer was on the loose. Annie Schwartz is a crime reporter for the Waukesha Freeman newspaper in Milwaukee. It was very much business as usual before Jeffrey Dahmer was caught. Uh, because of the nature of the victims, the kinds of people that he chose, they were people that, that for the most part weren't missed by their families. They were often people who were tossed aside by their families because they were, uh, they were gay or they had problems with the police. He chose his victims uh, very carefully. He chose people that wouldn't be missed. If families were not missing the victims, Jeffrey Dahmer's family was missing clues that something was terribly wrong. There were close calls, like this one with his father, Lyle. I had a box in my yeah, uh, I saw this. bedroom closet, and uh, it, it uh, contained uh, the mummified head and, and uh, genitals of uh, mm. a young man I met oh. in the bars down in Milwaukee. And it was a locked metal box. He got from his uh, grandmother. My dad, uh, one week came to visit and happened to see it and uh, wondering what was in it. He didn't know. Nobody knew. Of course. I told him it was uh, pornography, some magazines. And we, he wasn't satisfied with that answer. We got into uh, a bit of an argument because I wouldn't open it up. He uh, took the, the locked box down to the basement and was about to uh, smash it open. But I came back in the house, we reconciled. The reconciliation with his father would mean the lies would go on and that Jeffrey Dahmer would continue to hunt down victims in the gay bars of Milwaukee and kill them. This is happening in his but grandmother's house. In a city house. with a relatively low crime rate, why were the police not connecting the murders? Dahmer's seeming normality helped him hide his reign of terror. People like Dahmer can get away with this easier because law enforcement does not recognize him for what he is. Uh, they're looking for somebody who's dragging their knuckles on the pavement and baying at the moon with hair in their face. Uh, they're not looking for Mr. Nice Guy, the quiet young man living in the neighborhood. But there may have been something more to why the murders went unnoticed. Okay, hi. Um, this, um, yeah, this state. ticked me off this so is bad. Man, he is butt naked. He has been beaten up. He is very bruised up. He can't stand. He's study fall out. He has he is butt naked. He has no clothes on. He was really hurt. And I, you know, I ain't got no quarter on him. I just seen him. And he needs some help. Where is he at? On uh, 25th Estate, the corner of 25th Estate. He's just on the corner of the he, street? Yeah, he in the middle of the street. He fell out. We trying to help him. Some people trying to help him. Okay, and he's unconscious right now? Yeah, he getting him up. He is, uh, he is bruised up. Somebody must have jumped on him and stripped him or whatever. Yeah. The call is about this young man, Conorak Synthes and Phone. The voice is that of a neighbor, Glenda Cleveland, who spotted the young man trying to escape Jeffrey Dahmer's apartment. Dahmer had already tried to perform his crude sex zombie experiment on the 14-year-old, drilling a hole in his head and pouring in acid. Drugged, bleeding, dazed, the young man had somehow managed to get away from Dahmer and yell for help. The police did come. Jeffrey Dahmer told the police that Synthes and Phone was his 19-year-old lover with whom he'd been quarreled. And they believed him. The police went into Dahmer's apartment, saw nothing amiss, and returned the boy. The police then radioed back to the station, joking about what they had seen. An intoxicated Asian naked male was returned to his sober boyfriend. My partner's going to get deloused at the station. A month later, when Jeffrey Dahmer was arrested, he admitted to killing Synthesome Phone shortly after police left. The death would cost the two police officers their jobs. 
and would force the entire city to look inward at attitudes and treatment of minorities and gays. There would be candlelight vigils and city decreed days of healing, but Jeffrey Dahmer would leave a black mark on Milwaukee. The place where Dahmer's apartment building stood was raised and uh, put a playground in, raised all kinds of money from the community, and no one in the community wanted to use this playground because they said it was the devil's playground. I think that the city of Milwaukee, at the end of the Jeffrey Dahmer case, was left with the unfortunate realization that it can happen here. It being whatever horrific thing that you see on the news that you think happens in other places and to other people. There was the sad realization for people that live in the city of Milwaukee that it could and did happen here. But of course, the deepest scars would be reserved for the victim's families and the family of the murderer. Never, Jeffrey! Jeffrey! I hate you! That's out of control! Don't me, Jeffrey! I'll kill you! Look at me, You took my mother's oldest grandchild from her. And for that, I can never forgive you. I hope you... I hope you can deal with what you've done. The families of Jeffrey Dahmer's victims had their day in court and an opportunity to address him. Jeffrey Dahmer sat motionless throughout. His father, Lionel, sat behind him. Jeffrey's crimes had been a terrible shock for him, so much so that for the first 24 hours after he learned of them, he didn't believe Jeffrey's confession. I just... How can you see your son who has been riding a tricycle and, and, uh, and running around with his dog, Frisky, and uh, playing tennis with me, taking a knife and cutting a person open, and then doing sexual things. Mm, it's pretty hard. Those who profile serial killers can understand why Lionel would have such trouble reconciling his baby boy with the adult killer who would perpetrate such sickening crimes. We do know that when puberty comes, the ages of 13, 14, 15, that the hormones seem to interact with the brain chemistry, and we have no idea what that's doing or where it's coming from. I think probably there was a, a, a mixture of feelings of anger and hate and, and disappointment and, and just, and also feeling extremely sorry for what he did. Um, you know, felt very sorry for victims and their families and and uh, and also for Jeff, the terrible waste. Both Lionel Dahmer and Joyce Flint, Jeffrey's mother, struggled to find a way to support their son in the face of his crimes. You can't! A brutal task for any parent to endure. There's thing, something or things so deeply locked up in, in his mind that uh, even he doesn't know what's going on. And therefore, I have to hug him. It's almost like I don't have a right to mourn or grieve because there are all these families who will never, ever speak to their children again. By all accounts, Jeffrey Dahmer seemed to be relieved that he had been caught. He cooperated thoroughly with authorities and a battery of doctors and profilers who wanted to learn more about his behavior. What was uncontrollable about Jeffrey Dahmer was the urge. It was the urge he couldn't control. It was the craving he had to satisfy. And that's why when he killed, when he killed, he killed because he couldn't satisfy the urge any other way and had to do it immediately. And this is something Dahmer seemed to know better than anyone. At his sentencing, he read a statement of apology for his crimes. Your Honor, it is over now. This has never been a case of trying to get free. I didn't ever want freedom. Frankly, I wanted death for myself. This was a case to tell the world that I did what I did not for reasons of hate. I hated no one. I knew I was sick or evil or both. Now I believe I was sick. I know how oh, yeah. much harm I have caused. I tried to do the best I could after the arrest to make amends, but no matter what I did, I could not undo the terrible harm I have caused. 
I know I will be in prison for the rest of my life. The rest of Jeffrey Dahmer's life would last less than two years. Yeah, he would In November it. of 1994, a fellow inmate of Dahmer's beat him to death. The killing occurred in a 20-minute period when the men were unguarded. Yep. Although Dahmer expressed repeated remorse for his actions, in the last interview he granted before his death, he made a stunning admission that he still had fantasies of killing. It never completely goes away. I'll uh, probably have to live with it for the rest of my life. I wish it would go away. I wish I, there was some way to completely get rid of, of the, the compulsive thoughts, the feelings. Uh, it's not nearly so bad now that there, there's no avenues to, to actually act on it. But uh, no, it never seems to go completely away. J Rock says this, this sicko, uh, this jabroni, Rudy Poo, candy ass, piece of trailer park trash. No rhyme intended on that line. Jeffrey Dahmer stood up there and gave the interview, you know, couldn't help myself. It was just, no. J Rock don't want to hear me. J Rock don't want to hear you couldn't help yourself. All right? How about this? Why didn't you do it in public if you couldn't help yourself? Why didn't you let everybody see it if you couldn't help yourself? Why didn't you kill the people while people were watching? Why didn't you do that if you couldn't help yourself? If you had no control over what was happening, you just had to do it. Why didn't you do it in open? Why didn't you do it folks could see it? Why do you have to bring them back to your apartment where no one could see what you were doing? That lets J. Rock know you knew exactly what you were doing. You were in complete control. It just was an excuse you gave yourself. I, I, I just couldn't help it. Yeah, you could. You just didn't want it. That's the lie you tell yourself. And it ain't just Jeffrey. All of us, we have these things we do behind closed doors nobody knows about. Then we lie and say, well, I just couldn't help it. You couldn't help it. You just didn't want to. You liked what you were doing. It felt good. And Jeffrey Dahmer bringing men back to his apartment, drugging them, having sex with them, killing them, uh, cutting them up, that aroused him. He loved how that felt. And so it wasn't a matter of he couldn't help it. He just liked how it felt. Now, where he got the unction to let that arouse him, well, only God knows that. But it is an evil and twisted thing to say I want to kill somebody and have sex with them in order to get off like bro I know it was back in the 70s and 80s I don't know if they had sex dolls back then but just get you a I'd rather you get you a sex doll than to do that because this dude they showed it on Netflix where he would actually uh, fry their hearts in the skillet and eat them like I mean I don't know, did he have some steak sauce with it? Like, he had no mashed potatoes, he had a beer. They didn't talk about his drinking problem. Like, he got kicked out of the army for drinking too much. He couldn't hold down a job. Like, bruh, man, was just, just an evil dude. Just be, a, just be blunt with him, right? Um, how do you, how do you support a child? Right, I, I, J. Rock has babies, right, and I don't know as much as I love my kids. If J. Rock found out that his kids did something like this, you can't support them. Still love them. You don't ever stop loving your kids. There's nothing they can do to make you stop loving them. But as far as like, yeah, I got your back. I'm, no, I'm not paying no legal fees. I'm not getting you no good lawyer. Bro, you on your own in this one. All right? And Jeffrey didn't want to get out. He confessed to everything. Yeah, I did. I killed all of them. I don't, got, I don't need no attorney. And I think Netflix did a real good job because they spent a long time. It was 10 episodes. Most of the time, there was like little short reenactments, little quick movie, hour, hour and a half, two hours. This was a long 10 episodes. And they went into a lot of detail, right? You know, he tried to have relationships like good, 
honorable relationship with one guy who was deaf. Uh, but one one day when the guy said, hey, I got to leave and go to work, Jeffrey didn't like that. Jeffrey didn't like folks leaving him because he, he didn't like, because that's what his parents did. His parents left him. And so, yeah, it was the, uh, the, the series talked about how the deaf guy left and came back. And when he came back, Jeffrey just, it was it. I'm like, that's just, hmm. And then to this 14 year old, those police officers, see here's the thing. In the series, they got suspended with, they got paid leave, sound familiar? They got paid leave. And then the union fought to get them back on the force, where in real life they lost their job. Like they got fired. Like there's, there is no excuse you can give for you to hand back a 14 year old kid without saying he looks bruised, beat up. Look, I don't know what's going on with y'all. All right, he's drunk and wasted. We need to help him sober up. We need to get him into the hospital. He's butt naked. Something about this just seems off. All right, just off. And you have neighbors telling you something is off. Now you're supposed to be the police. This is supposed to be your job to protect and serve. Nothing about this seems off to you. It was like, look, this your lover? Okay, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna take him to the hospital. We're gonna get him sober up. We're gonna make sure that he's okay. And if he tells us y'all together, hey, no harm done, we apologize. But something about this just seems off. They did none of it. They are like, all right, well, go head back, y'all do your thing. And then they laughed about it. Man, you don't, you, don't get to, you don't get to be a security guard, let alone a police officer. Like, you don't get to protect nothing, right? Nothing. I'm not saying you can't work and earn an honest living, but I'd be damned if you're going to be in any form of enforcement ever again. But I might do some more Jeffrey Dahmer videos. Y'all let me know what you think about this. Give me your thoughts on Jeffrey Dahmer and everything that happened, all right? Post your comments down below. Let J-Rock know what you thought of his reaction to this video. No rhyme intended on that line. If you enjoyed the Great Ones reaction, hit that like button, subscribe, and share. Make sure that you hit that bell so you can be notified when it is time to be electrified. Thank you for joining J-Rock. Stay tuned for my next video. Mamba, Gigi, and Wakanda forever. If you smell out, but J-Rock is cooking.